You're taking care of business with Marty and Clay on Bakersfield's Right Choice for Saturday Talk. Current Radio, News Talk 1180. We are back on Taking Care of Business on Kern Radio News Talk 1180. I have to tell you, Goose is sitting behind the glass with his big Giants T-shirt on. I think he's, uh, yeah, <laughs> I think he's going to, he's hoping it's going to be the Giants against the Rangers. So it should be interesting to see what happens. Uh, we are with, we are uh, on the phone live with Sally Pipes. If you want to call in and join us, it's eight four two Kern. That's eight four two five three seven six. Sally, I've got a couple questions on your books. Uh, you've written two books, one called Miracle Cure, How to Solve America's Health Care Crisis and Why Canada Isn't the Answer. And that has a foreword by Milton Friedman. Yes. And uh, that's that's pretty impressive. And the second book, which I got to look at a little bit, is The Top Ten Myths of American Health Care, A Citizen's Guide. And Steve Forbes did the foreword on uh, on that particular book. Yes, and my latest book, which just came out um, in August, was from Regnery. It's called The Truth About Obamacare. And it's a real analysis, a 240-page sort of written-for-the-man-in-the-street analysis of the 2,400-page um, Obamacare. And it, you know, I wrote it because um, when I saw, that, when I heard Nancy Pelosi say, we have to pass this bill so we can find out what's in it, um, I thought a book has to be written on what is in it. And, of course, Pelosi, um, you know, that, it was just such a ridiculous statement. And then Regnery came to me and said, how would you like to write a book, The Truth About Obamacare?, and so I thought, well, I'll jump at the opportunity because, you know, it's so important. And then, of course, a month ago, um, Senate, um, Senator uh, Max Baucus from Montana at a town hall meeting, when asked by it, was, when he was questioned, he said, well, of course, I just didn't have time to read um, the 2,400-page bill. And so I, I've been saying, you know, if he wants to know what's in the bill as well, they should both read my book, The Truth About Obamacare. But isn't it frightening that, you know, some of our top people, the House, the Speaker of the House and the one of the senior senators didn't even read the bill. I mean, to me, this is absolutely frightening. Yeah, it, it's scary. And then uh, Clay and I have been to a couple of seminars where they were talking about the bill. One of the things they said is that the 2,400 pages is basically an outline, and they're looking at a couple of hundred thousand pages by the time it's done. Well, I mean, that's absolutely. frightening. Well, yes, because, you know, as I said, there are about, uh, um, there are a thousand mentions in the Affordable Care Act saying the secretary of HHS will have the power to do this and to do that. And so when you have to write the regs, I mean, right now, you know, just on Thursday, the National um, Association of Insurance Commissioners down in Florida uh, voted to accept the medical loss ratios. That is the uh, um, percentage that an insurance company collects in premium that they have to pay out in uh, medical claims. So 80% for uh, the individual in the small group market and 85% for the large group market and so now that has gone to Kathleen Sebelius for them to actually write the regs on the medical loss ratio. And so, you know, insurance companies are rightfully very upset about, you know, how are they going to implement this next year? Um, and it's, it's going to really um, have a negative impact on, on, on insurance and, and, of course, the cost of insurance. So, um, you know, these are they're frightening things, the power that is being given to um, Kathleen Sebelius, Secretary of HHS. And then the other point is that she, um, you know, there, while there is no public option in the Affordable Care Act, there was in the House bill, which was is a government-run insurance um, company that would, you know, compete against private insurers in these state-run exchanges in 2014. Well, already, um, you know, Sebelius and Jay Angoff, who is the head of the Office of Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight, they, you know, they say that if insurance companies have excessive premiums, what they deem to be excessive, they will ban these insurance companies from competing in the insurance exchanges. They have, they're keeping a list of what, what, what insurance companies have excessive increases, and they've said, of course, there will be zero tolerance for this. But I think this is opening up the way for you know, public option, government option, in these insurance exchanges, and that will be the end of private insurance in this country as we know it. Well, we're already seeing it's coming to an end. I mean, we're talking about grandfather plans, and uh, grandfather plans are really non-existent. Then they talk about giving these small group employers up to a uh, 35% tax credit, but that won't apply to the private sector. It'll only apply to the government-run exchanges in the future. 
Well, and I think, you know, one of the things that, that people don't realize when they hear the president say, you know, we're, we've got um, tax credits for small business. Well, you know, only less, fewer than two million small businesses will even pass the first three out of four tests to qualify right. for the full credit. So, you know, six, so, I mean, we're already hearing from small businessmen that, you know, if they already offer private insurance to their employees because of the, the guaranteed issue community rating, all of these regs, they're going to say, you know, we're going to, they've said we're going to stop offering insurance and, and employees can go and buy their insurance in these, um, in the state run exchanges. So, um, you know, it's, 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 it's just, you know, not the truth. Um, the, the president has not told the American people the truth about, you know, these tax credits for small business. And, and of course, small business is the engine of growth in this country. It's not, you know, big corporations that create jobs. It's small entrepreneurs. And this is really the Affordable Care Act is going to destroy the entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and if, if you look at the, the reporting requirement um, under the 1099s, you know, small business is going to have a hard time, you know, reporting, filing with the IRS every transaction, business transaction that they do over $600 a year. This is one of the things that I think if the Republicans take back the House um, this fall that could actually re- be repealed because a number of Democrats also think this is going to be a very onerous requirement on particularly small business. Oh, that, that's going to be a total disaster. I mean, how could we? how can we conceivably... Clay and I are small businessmen. How can we conceivably hand out uh, 1099s for anything over $600? I mean, it, uh, it's a nightmare. I'm, I'm not even sure the IRS is, is happy with that because of the amount of regulation and people they'd have to hire and train just to enforce that law. It's, it's, it's silly. It's, it's beyond silly. Well, you know, of course, you know, under the Affordable Care Act, the, the administration has said they will be hiring 16,000 new IRS agents just to comply with the, in, to see that the American people are complying, um, you know, starting in 2014 with the individual mandate, because if they, if you can't show you have insurance in 2014 on your tax return, you will have to start paying this fine, which will be fully operational in 2016. So if you think about 16,000 new IRS agents plus 159 new boards and commissions under the Affordable Care Act. So one of the other things that I'm hopeful if the GOP takes back the House that the um, that the defunding um, of some of these things, like 16,000 new IRS agents, um, people that will staff these boards and commissions, um, and also changes to Medicare and Medicaid, um, one can only hope that these appropriations can be starved off so we can start to work on um, cutting back on the Affordable Care Act. And then ultimately, if the Republicans take back the presidency and Congress in 2012, then in 2013, um, if they have a strong leader and, a, and stiff spines, we can maybe see this um, intrusion of government into our health care system be repealed and replaced with a health care plan that really will help those Americans who um, don't have um, health care coverage, but not by mandate and regulations, which, is, which are part of Obamacare. Sally, if you don't mind, I'd like to correct you on one thing, and you keep saying the same thing over again. I don't, hope you don't mind. It's actually the Patient Protection and Unaffordable Care Act, isn't it? Right. Well, it's, it's really the Patient Non-Protection and Unaffordable Care Act. There you go, because, non-protection. Yeah, exactly, because, you know, when you look at it, um, you know, the president said he had two goals. One was universal coverage, and the other was bending the cost curve down. Well, the Congressional Budget Office has said by 2019, still 23 million Americans will be uninsured, and the cost curve... Um, but, you know, the president's goal was to have a $900 billion health care plan um, over 10 years um, and not to exceed that amount. Well, we know that most of the um, requirements under Obamacare come into effect in 2014. And if you look at the decade from 2014 to 2024, this is going to cost the American people about $2.5 trillion. So that cost curve is going to go up. And when the president kept saying the average American family will see their health care premiums go down by $2,500. The Congressional Budget Office said, well, actually, they're going to grow by $2,100 for the average family. And finally, the president said about three weeks ago, well, we couldn't expect to bend the cost curve down if we're adding 30 million people, 34 million people to, to you know, have um, health insurance, either through um, Medicaid, where they're going to add 18 million people to Medicaid, or the, the rest of the people getting um, uh, subsidies, federal government subsidies, to buy insurance in the exchange. So, 
you know, the cost is not going to go down and we're not going to achieve universal coverage. And when you look at the 50.7 million Americans who are uninsured, you know, you really have to break that down because when you look at it, 17 million of them are people who are already eligible for Medicaid, the program for low-income seniors, and they haven't signed up. And the question is why? And I believe it's because under Medicaid, people find it very difficult to get a doc because docs have these very low reimbursement rates. And so we're going to add 18 more million more people to Medicaid, and these people can't find a doctor now. So, you know, it's very important to see who are the 50.7 million. And there are only about 6 million people who are chronically ill without health insurance for two years or more. And those are the people that we needed to take care of rather than throwing out the finest health care system in the world in order to have government take over our health care. Amazing. Sally, can we hold you through another break? Yes, thank you. Great, thank you. This is Taking Care of Business on Kern Radio, News Talk 1180.